Oh, Lori, thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's Easter. This is exciting, right? Yeah, this is good. Yeah, all right, whatever. I'm just glad it landed on a Sunday this year. It was just good for all of us that way. Uh, the lilies up front, if you have a, uh, a shut-in, somebody in the hospital, someone elderly, something that you want to take one of those and give them to them today, you are welcome to do that. Just grab it after the service. The ones up front, any lily up here, if you want to take those and deliver it, that would be perfectly fine with us. We would love to bless somebody with those. Um, excluding Halloween... This is the number one candy day of the year. How many of you already consume chocolate today? Come on, be proud. Nice. Okay, more adults than I had expected. You I expected. That was not even, that's why I didn't even look. And then you may put your hand down. Yeah, there you go. She's that proud of it. 120 million pounds of candy are bought each year. And that means 90 million chocolate bunnies. Anyone get a chocolate bunny? Oh yeah, you guys are all cheap. You're like, no, those things are expensive. What does that mean? You don't know if you got one yet? Okay. Oh, the cheap part. Okay, that got you. And it was like 76% of people eat the ears first. I know you want to know that. Very, very rare, like... 5% 5% of people eat the, um, the tail first. Think about that. That might be you. Very few eat the... It's always the ears. You want the ears first. And I like Easter. I loved the... How many, you grew up with um, always a new suit, new dress on Easter. Let me see. That was your way growing up. Yeah. Today, I still see a lot of it today. I, I'll never forget the... Uh, I had a light blue leisure suit. Man, that was sweet. My brother's was like a light lime green. I know, just when I thought mine was bad, then it was his. You can store it in a pile because it didn't wrinkle. If it did, it wasn't going to look worse, right? I mean, it, so it actually just negated that. I, I can still, I can picture walking from Grandma Williams' house, and she was the one that was born in Cannonsburg, but this is in Ohio, walking from her house in my ridiculous suit, feeling like a million bucks, carrying a big Easter basket as a high school kid. And she said, as long as I'm alive, you're getting an Easter basket. It's like, well, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be looking for it from you. So, so this is a big day. This is Easter. This is all the festivities and the excitement out there. The Easter eggs are all spread out. That's going to be a ton of fun. And adults just hang out down there with refreshments and just kind of enjoy, enjoy the morning because it's a beautiful day today. And I love it. I like all about it. But of course we know today's about Jesus. I'm not opposed to all the other fun stuff. I'm, if it's a party, count me in. I'm, I'm in. And you throw in chocolate from Paradise Bakery or uh, confectionery right in town. How many go to Paradise? Okay, if you don't know of it, if I can get, if I can get Saris out of your lips, go to Paradise. It's local, not quite as big, a little smaller. Am I right, Ryan? little smaller. It's in their garage. But, but I'm going to tell you, it's great chocolate. So Google that, and you need to head there this week and get all the leftover bunnies that didn't get picked up. I'm all for all of that stuff. But today, I want to read part of that great story. It's in Luke chapter 12 or 24. If you have a Bible, you could follow along. If you have it in your phone, it's Luke 24. Because this is it. This is what it's all about. This started it. it was first day of the week. At nearly dawn, they went to the tomb, taking spices they'd prepared, and they found the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And they went in. They didn't find the body of our Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, 
and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on third day rise. Like, do you guys not remember he said that? They remembered his words. In, remembering, in returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and then to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them, told these things to the apostles. These words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they didn't believe it. But Peter rose, and he ran. He ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths all by themselves, and he went home marveling at what happened. There it is. It's the story. It's the account. Someday we'll look into the, the oddity of having the women so much as a part of the first witnesses. If you're to make it up, that's the last thing you would have done. They couldn't even testify in court. And they're going to be so involved in this. Why? Is because it happened. This isn't made up. This is what happened. And I want to talk just for fun. Like, like no, no deep anything. It's... It was so perfect, and I want to speak on three things that were perfect about that morning, about Jesus, the life of Jesus, and how perfect it was. And there's notes in your, in your bulletin if you want to follow along. The first one is that it was perfectly stated he's God. It was perfectly stated. It is remarkable to me the number of people who say and fully mean it, you know, Jesus never actually claimed to be God. I remember we were on the campus of Arizona State University and there were three students coming across and we were talking about Jesus with them. And he said that and he had such an honest, non-offensive look. And he goes, well, he never claimed to be God. And I was set back because I'm like, you really believe that? He claimed to be God. NPR, which is our tax dollars at work, right? National Public Radio. I'm actually, I listen to it a lot, even though they're pretty much against about everything that I happen to believe. Listen to this. This is from NPR. During his lifetime, Jesus himself didn't call himself God and didn't consider himself God. And none of his disciples had any inkling at all that he was God. I'm glad we set that straight. Thank you, National Public Radio. There was a guy named John Crossman. He was a, he was a part of a group called the Jesus Seminar. It's still around today under a different name. And this Jesus Seminar promoted this idea that there is a historical Jesus and then there's a biblical Jesus. So when you and I would go to a bookstore and see a book about Jesus that has somehow has that historical Jesus idea to it, you and I are like, ooh, that looks good. No, what they're separating is that there is the historical Jesus who was this common guy, never claimed to be God, no one thought he was God, he was just a good teacher, and then it became all this folklore to become what we know him as today. So imagine this room full of people. This is the Jesus Seminar. They actually did this. They sit in a room and they would read a section of Jesus and they had in front of them a little bowl of beads. And the beads were colored. And the beads, they'd read a section of something that Jesus did and they would look in their little bowl and they would put a pink bead out and say, yep, Jesus said that. Or they'd fish through and get a red one and says, probably said it, or a gray one that said, very good ideas, but probably didn't say it. And then finally, a black bee that says, no, no way that he said that. No, this is what, this is scholarship. 
This is what they decided they would go through and decide. So after 2,000 years of us accepting the Bible as a historical document, believe it or not, you cannot believe it, but as a historical document, we're now pulling the rug out from under it and saying these things aren't even what he really said. If it's non-sensational, yeah, he probably said that. There's a guy named Howard Clark Key esteemed professor at Boston University and actually a regular at Penn State where he said in theology today he said the conclusions reached by these people these scholars are inerrant simply by their presuppositions and methods that they used he goes it doesn't even make sense D James Kennedy the great evangelist and about everything else he did down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, made a great observation. He said, didn't it seem like it's open season on Christians and even Christ these days? The character of the only perfect human to ever live is being dragged through the mud by those with the respectability of degrees behind their name. We just open the word and read it for ourselves. For instance, there's a paralytic man, and Jesus, rather than heal him, actually said out loud in front of everybody, said, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, it created panic. This is exactly the response. It's in Mark 2. The scribe said, why does he speak like that? He's blaspheming. Only God can forgive. This is over and over and over. He claimed clearly and perfectly that he is God. Great scene. Crowd wrapped around. Jesus said the famous words, I and my Father are one. To me and you, we're like, yeah, okay, I get that. For instance, maybe somebody here speaks against John, my friend John over here, and I can say, oh, no, hang on a second. John and I are one. You go against John, you're against me. Maybe one in purpose. Well, in the Greek, I and my father are one. One meant, in essence, the same person. And you go, oh, yeah, maybe. That's Greek. Okay, forget that. Jesus said, I and my Father are one, and immediately the crowd scrambled for rocks to stone him. Ooh, maybe it's more than one in purpose. Jesus said, whoa, wait a second. I have done many wonderful things in front of you. For which of these are you stoning me? Is this a great question? He's even leading them to say it must be something that I've done. And they, while they're scrambling for rocks and said, for none of the things that you've done, but because you, a mere man, claim to be God. <laughs> he never really claimed it. No, he regularly claimed it. It was regularly testified about him that he was God. And let's never forget, two days ago, Friday, the night of the crucifixion, he was crucified because he claimed to be God. It's perfect. This is a fun little section here. The next one, I'm just thinking the perfect God. He's, he perfectly stated that he's God. I also want to make a note that he had perfect EQ. Probably a more common or more contemporary way to say it. You and I have an IQ. It's an intelligent quotient. You're born with it. Whatever you have, you have. The gene pool in my family needed a little chlorine. IQ, not great. In fact, I literally said out loud, as all three of our kids and my wife were all honor society in school, I actually said out loud, I, I thought, I said, you know, that's really interesting. I went to Elyria High School in Elyria, Ohio. Huh, I don't think they had an honor society. <laughs> and I meant it. And Sarah, so sweet, she goes, mm hmm, no, they might have. 
yeah, they, they probably kind of went about things without you. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that. That's IQ. You're born with you have what you have. Then there's EQ, that you learn. That's the emotional quotient. More successful people in the world, EQ. Not IQ, it's EQ. Do you have your emotions under control? There's study. You can look at the fun studies of all the emotions of Jesus. Well, that's one study in itself. His empathy. He was frustrated at times. Sadness at loss and death. Wonderful compassion. Amazing the amount of passages that speak of his compassion. Happiness. Anger. He had it all. That's not EQ. EQ is having all of that in balance and doing it at the right time. That's where we get lost. There's a great old sentence, and many of you have heard it maybe many times. It was Aristotle that said, 300 years before Jesus, said, anybody can be angry. That's easy. But to be angry in the right time, to the right person in the right degree at the right time for the right purpose in the right way, that is not easy. <laughs> right? <clears throat> Times in which Jesus should have been furious and he wasn't. H how did that happen? How was it when he is on the cross, when he really could have been legitimately angry, he was calm? In fact, his emotions were actually being steered to take care of mom. He actually controlled his emotions so much that he says to God, not get me out of here, but don't hold this against them. How does he do that? Flip tables one moment, calm and cool the next. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, there's a wonderful passage where he's dealing with the Pharisees, and in his conversation with the Pharisees on the subject of divorce. So they're trying to catch him, trying to trick him. He's in a conversation. He sees kids are starting to come his way. Disciples hold back the kids. Good for them, by the way. Jesus is in some serious talk. Not a great time, right? I mean, that's what you'd want. That's he, later. The Bible says that he looks and sees what the disciples are doing, and he is indignant with his disciples. He's angry at the disciples and then turns and welcomes the little kids. So now he's, he's the fun uncle. He's having fun with the kids. Then he changes again and teaches the crowd off of them and says, hey, by the way, unless you come to the Father like a little kid, you're never going to see the kingdom of heaven. How does he do that? Because he's perfect. From angry to silent to grief to happiness. No one could control the emotions like Jesus did. But then also perfect fulfillment. Perfect fulfillment. The death and resurrection of Jesus was not accidental. It wasn't unfortunate. It was the perfect plan, not an accident. Turned out to be a good thing. No, it was all on purpose. In 1905, there was a little 11-year-old uh, kid. Uh, his name is Frank, uh, Frank Epstein. Frank was 11, and just like a typical little kid, he's messing around with a little concoction, wanted to make his own uh, soft drink, his own soda. So he had a powder in there, and he had stuff, and he has a little stick to stir it, and he needed it chilled. This is San Francisco. It was winter, a little unseasonably cold, set it outside overnight, and it froze. So he 
breaks this thing loose. And that was called an epsicle. 11 year old kid named it after himself. Epsicle. The epsicle, he actually would go and make a whole bunch of them and he would sell it outside of baseball stadiums and a fair if there's a carnival. And then his kids, he's now married, he's got kids. <clears throat> kids are growing up, they're all eating epsicles. They changed the name because they wanted to name it after Pop. It's a true story. So they changed it to Popsicle. They made a fortune. They sold it to a company on the East Coast, the patent for this thing. It was an accident. Made a fortune off of this thing. We've all eaten Popsicles. There was a guy in the Navy trying to build these springs to keep equipment more stable at sea. Richard James, and he's messing with these things, and one popped loose and started bouncing. Yeah, that was the slinky. He spent the rest of his time out at sea playing with this spring that he'd figured out. He forgot about his task. He's having fun with this thing and ended up getting it patented, and now, of course, how many enjoyed the slinky. I don't know, somehow we need to ingrain in our mind that what Jesus did was exactly on purpose. It was the design all along. This is what was planned. Whether it was understood all along or not, they didn't expect that. They thought a king was going to show up and he was going to start ruling. He never planned that. This wasn't plan B. This was the plan. This is the plan. Acts 2 said, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Think about yourself. We're 2,000 years later. It's still the plan. The plan is that he died in your place. He died for you. Get church out of your mind. Get denominations out of your mind and all these extra things that we add and require and change constantly. Forget all of this. Forget about religiosity. Just think about what Jesus did. What Jesus did was he died for you because you were owned into your sin. You were stuck. There was no way out. Listen to 1 Peter 1. We are ransomed. We are ransomed because we were owned by sin. There was no way out. We are ransomed, <clears throat> saved from this futile life with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. There it is. I'm glad he didn't just come and serve as a good example. As many will teach today, he served as a perfect example. Follow Jesus and live the way he lived. And I'll say, you can't. And it's not enough. If you and I decide somehow, miraculously, from this day forward, I will not sin again. I will follow Jesus, I'll do everything he says from now on, and you and I will die in sin and will be forever separated from God. What's going to happen with all the sin that we've already committed? That's why we need it ransomed, bought out of. That's what redeemed mean. We were redeemed and bought out of sin because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and you and I are all exactly the same. My sin and yours, you may have some really spectacular sin examples that may make us all blush. 
Others of you, eh, a little boring. You didn't go after it quite like the guys next to you. Doesn't matter. It's all the same. It all turned out to be the same because we were created for union with God <clears throat> and we chose disobedience, sin. He cannot associate with sin. So we're separated from him. <clears throat> and when we die in that sin, it's forever separation. But Jesus said, no, wait a second, wait a second. How about if I take it? I said, well, no, that, that would mean, <clears throat> excuse me, that would mean you'd have to take all the punishment. You've got to carry on you the sin of everybody and die for it. He goes, yeah, let's do it. Well, you actually need to be them. You know, you need to be them. You, you can't just come out of nowhere. You need to live a sinless life, no sin, and yet suffer the payment of all of that sin that you didn't commit. And so, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so whoever believes in him has everlasting life. That's what today is. And you may have been in church for a long time, for many years, and it's just what you do, and that's what you've done, and that's not what we're talking about. And you may be new to it all, and you're like, I don't even know if I fit well around here. My, my leisure suit doesn't fit anymore, and I'm just not going to fit around here as much as, I don't know what extreme you happen to be. We're all exactly the same. We're all separated from God because of sin, and then now with the balls in your court, what do you do? I chose to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Trust him only for eternal life. I was in junior high when I realized, hey, this makes sense. God, you do love me. You died for me. I trust you for my salvation. I trust you to have all my sin taken away, past, present, future. And for all who call upon the name of the Lord are saved. And that's where we stand today. It's one or the other. It's whether we have receive Jesus as our Savior or we haven't. My prayer, of course, for you is that you have. If you've been to Israel, there's a couple sites you always want to see, and one is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's a crowded area. It's always, seems to always be crowded, and it's, it's just almost unimaginable when you go in. The site was first built upon in the 300s, so pretty early. That was all torn down in about 1,000. In another 100 years, it was built back up again, and now you see this place that is built over two things. And if you saw a slice side picture of it, you can see the rendition. It's actually claiming to be built on the site of where Christ was crucified and the site of his burial. The thing on the screen is called an edicule. It's only like 300 years old. The edicule is inside the massive dome and that is built over top of the cave of which he was supposedly buried in. It's, it's over an acre building and you just meander and it's cold, like a castle. It's cold, it's dark. It's worth seeing. <clears throat> Probably the most visited site in Christianity. But then two miles from there is a place called Gordon's Tomb. Gordon's tomb is the place that we spend time. Gordon's tomb has really only been around there since the 1800s. It was discovered. What was discovered was it was a wine press and garden, and there were tombs carved out of the rock that were from the first century. 
No one doubts that. No one doubts that it's first century. No one doubts that it was a garden. And there's places you can sit around there and you can take communion and read. And I remember saying to the owner of the company that I traveled with, I said, hey, we're sharing. And we're just like all crying. And I'm just reading the passage. And he goes, seriously, are you hinting that it was you? I went, no, I'm just saying it was just, he goes, it's the setting. You open your Bible and just read it in that setting, and you're going to be moved to tears. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's true. The garden tomb is owned by a nonprofit organization out of England, and we happen to have on one of our trips a guide who has been doing this for decades. Great little English accent. He explains everything, and we sit. You can step into that tomb, and you can see the different burial areas inside that were 100% just like the tomb that Jesus would have been laid in. Even has a trough like where the stone would have rolled into place. And I love this guy's words. He goes, Was it here? He's like, eh. Was it at the Church of Holy Sepulcher? That dates back a long time. Was it another location that we have never found, that we have no idea where it is? He goes, I honestly, I don't know. He goes, what I will tell you is it was just like this. And the most important thing, he's not there. That's all you need to know. He's not there. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The same physical body that went in came out. It's called the first fruits. Those that you've lost, a loved one, maybe recently, maybe been a while, that had faith in Jesus Christ that Sunday morning, this Sunday morning, what Jesus Christ did is the same thing. That's what we look forward to with hope and confidence. How do we think it's going to happen? Are we confident? Because it happened. Everything Jesus said has happened. Everything that he has prophesied, everything that was prophesied about him has happened. So we can nip away like the critics, but it comes down to very simply the decision that you and I make, do I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior or not? The end of the entire Gospel of John ends with this phrase, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written. The account of Jesus was written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And that's up to you. If you've not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would today, even this morning. will not you bow and pray with me, if you would? Let's bow in prayer. If you aren't certain of a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, you can right now. It's between you and him. You could pray to him. Just pray, Heavenly Father, I need you. I'm sorry for my sin. Thank you for dying for me. I trust you for life, for eternal life. No one looking around, and if you prayed along with me, I'd love for you to acknowledge it. I won't come after you, but I'd love to be able to pray for you. If you prayed along with me, and you haven't done that before to receive Jesus, no one look. You just lift your hand up to me till I see it. Just kind of casually lift it up and back down again, and I would love to thank the Lord for you. That's right. Just lift it right back up and down again. That's it. And Heavenly Father, we are grateful for Jesus. He's perfect. We've said it today. We've loved this day. We love the festivities of this day. 
but we're most grateful for the salvation that we have through your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.